Welcome everyone um, to our panel on advancing the science of collaboration with AI. I'm very excited to have a wonderful discussion with our four panelists. Um, my name is Nia Nixon. I am an assistant professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and I have been fascinated in collaboration like my panelists for several, several years and the role of AI for some time. Um, I think that this is a very timely topic given the uh, innovation in science and technology that's been accelerating our reliance on, on teams and their collaborative efforts to solve important social, uh, most recently public health problems with COVID. Uh, and so today we're really gonna be diving into some critical questions around the use of AI and how it can be used to further the science of collaboration. Um, now I wanna open it up for very brief uh, introductions from our panelists on their research as it relates to those topics. So Carol, why don't we start with you? Okay, thanks Nia. I'm Carol Forsyth. I'm a research scientist at Educational Testing Service. Um, I focus mostly in the, well, in the area of cognitive science and on theoretically grounded data mining um, attempts at looking at various types of process data. And over the last few years, I uh, have been researching more and more on trying to get a measure of collaborative problem solving in digital environments. And that has spurred on a lot more curiosity and how we can do more interventions for formative type assessment in this area. So thanks for inviting me, Nia. Wonderful. Uh, Steve, would you like to go? Sure. Uh, Steve Fiore, University of Central Florida. Uh, I study cognition and collaboration, human interaction with technology, with any kinds of machines, but uh, more importantly, with each other. And I'm interested in how cognitive processes are modified by interactions with people or with a particular kind of technology, uh, but more importantly, how other people and how machines can make us smarter, make us better, stronger, faster, et cetera. And AI is <laughs> just a new tool on the block. Yeah. Wonderful. Angela? Hey, everyone. Uh, I am Angela Stewart at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so I'm in the Department of Informatics over there, as well as the Learning Research and Development Center. Uh, and these days, I'm thinking a lot about um, how can social robots uh, facilitate collaborative reflections amongst uh, mm -hmm. learners um, in computing education, um, as well as I've done some thinking on how to support collaborative problem solving um, with learners and um, how teachers kind of have discussions with learners in collaborative spaces. Wonderful. Nick? Uh, right, well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Nick Duran, and I'm Associate Professor in the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences at ASU at Arizona State. Uh, I'm also the area lead for this Cognition, Behavior, and Information Sciences uh, research group we have here. So broadly, I'm interested in areas related to language, cognition, and communication. and um, I have expertise in data science and other quantitative methods. And I'd say that the central thesis of my research is really um, that new insights into cognitive processing can be had by examining cognition expressed within patterns uh, over, of behavior over time. And, and this is a process that's deeply influenced by socially rich and communicative context. Um, so yes, the, my theoretical area is this area of behavioral dynamics, or human thought and action and environment, they're all coupled together. And there's these temporal dependencies that give way to new behaviors. And in the last five years or so, I've been able to uh, extend this work to the domain of communication dynamics within team-based collaborative problem solving. And this is work being done with uh, Sidney DeMello and his team over there at University of Colorado Boulder. And yeah, it's a little me. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad that I was able to rope you all together for one hour to <clears throat> pick your brains. Um, I wanted to start out on a very, I guess, a high note. So I'm really curious uh, what, from each of you, what are some of the most promising, perhaps like a state of the art um, uses of AI with collaboration that, that, you, that excites you? And whoever wants to go first can jump in.
Well, in, in general, of AI about collaboration or AI more generally? Uh, about collaboration. Okay, because I'm, um, I'm interested in the promise that is being made with regard to how AI can help with collaboration. I've yet to see uh, real implementations yet. And I, mm -hmm. I think um, some of the claims that I see being made, for example, with AI as a meeting support or as a meeting facilitator, um, I think has a lot of promise for not simply for meetings and organizations, but for education, because to the degree that they can develop AI that can monitor interactions and that kind of closed environment and offer advice and offer guidance, I think that um, it has potential for other environments like the classroom or like group learning kinds of contexts. Uh, but it's those, you all are more expert in on a lot of this than I am. So the degree to which they are successful in that, I think uh, remains to be seen. I would completely agree with that. Um, uh, I'll just pause to let others talk before I take over. I can hop in here. Um, so I actually think that um, some AI advances really do help with accessibility. So like, you know, we always kind of think about the, the what are the big kind of new ways that AI can create new interactions. But I think it's also worth like thinking about what are the, some of the maybe smaller or not smaller, uh, just um, uh, not necessarily as paradigm shifting um, things in NLP that are really helpful. So one example I could point to to, um, immediately is that there is a lot of AI um, and NLP technologies used in Zoom for auto captioning that can help with um, that can help with accessibility and collaborations. Um, uh, Panopto also has a lot of kind of underlying AI techniques that just allow people to have more access to remote collaborations, um, no matter what their um, disability status might be. What is Panopto? Oh, it's a, um, it does like uh, streaming. Um, so you can like stream um, webinars. Um, uh, people often stream talks, but um, it does some, has some really cool um, automatic detection of um, what's happening in your slides and captioning as well as um, adding titles for people to be able to follow along a lot easier, that sort of thing. Very cool. That sounds, I'll have to look it up later. <laughs> um, wonderful. So Carol or Nick, did you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat with Steve in that it's a lot of hypotheticals of what we could really do with this, but I think there's a lot of promise in the research that's in existence right now um, to be able to capitalize on this. But what what really makes it exciting is what, why are we even doing this uh, in the first place to me? Um, and that jumps back to obviously, you know, 21st century skills and we've all seen it with the pandemic. There's a lot more interactions that are online and we're having a, we need a lot of various uh, expertise and interdisciplinary teams to be able to solve a lot of the more complex problems that are coming out. To be able to actually do this, clearly, the big died, it, it takes collaborative problem solving. So I, I don't view collaborative problem solving in and of itself as just the new, okay, this is a cool domain to explore right now, but rather this is something we need to know how to do and to do well to be able to be successful in the constantly changing environment in which we live. And by doing this online or in a computer mediated environment, we do have the potential to profile various types of collaborative problem solvers on different dimensions, see who is contributing and who is not, using NLP techniques, using um, clustering algorithms. We can, we can begin to track what people know and what they don't know. And by doing so, we can then add interventions to help people be better at these types of skills. I don't see that possible in a face-to-face -face environment because it's what teacher can observe every single, you got three groups, how, how are you gonna observe every last discourse move, every last behavior? It's just not humanly possible. So a lot of the research that's been conducted to be able to see these profiles, such as your own, Nia, um, 
I think provide us with a lot of opportunity for intervention that otherwise would not be possible, whether it be by chatbots, whether it be by just um, uh, controllable text generation, lots, lots of different options at our hands of how we could go about this. I think that's an interesting take on it, this idea that, it, I mean, it goes back to just things at scale uh, in the context of um, there's just human interaction and, and the sort of micro temporally dependent uh, data streams that it, it relies on or we can't as humans capture all of that or a teacher in that context can't capture all of that. We are actually really good at that in one-on-one -on -one or even small group interactions. But of course, like we're doing a lot of that subconsciously and an ability that AI kind of provides us with or has the potential, let me say, to provide us with is um, monitoring all of those things at once to provide suggestions for how to be better, how to be a better collaborator, a better teammate, to think a little bit differently than maybe you were, uh, you're used to. Um, and I, I think that's, so that's sort of like AI in support, right? Um, I'm curious to see what you guys, or if you have any thoughts around, so I guess the way I think of this in my head is like AI can be, you know, a, a service to that we use to model something, right? So it's not even really involved in any way in the collaboration. We're using it to quantify or characterize different dynamics from a team. Then there can be more of a AI in the loop where maybe that's around what Carol was saying, AI for intervention. And then at maybe the very other end that we're not, that Steve pointed out earlier, we're not there yet, but we're kind of trying to go there is, AI as teammates. So completely integrated into the system as if it's a teammate. So it's not just there to uh, provide support for other teammates, but actually act as a teammate. So I guess I'm, I'm I, and I feel like there's a lot for to be done before we can get to that other end of the spectrum. But I think it's really interesting to kind of think about what that maybe looks like for teams, uh, how it facilitates or even hinders teams. Um, because people notoriously react not great to um, AI systems, <laughs> um, particularly when they're impersonating humans in some capacity. So I'll just leave that open comment there and see if that is interesting to anyone. Just a point of clarification, because uh, I think context matters so heavily in a lot of these discussions. Um, are we talking about like a, a virtual classroom where you have students sitting around, not unlike this, it's a Zoom meeting, um, where you think that AI has a, a better capability of monitoring because the, the situation is easily monitorable? Um, or are you talking about um, a non-virtual classroom as another context in which these kinds of interactions can be uh, facilitated or monitored? And if the latter, uh, do you think that there's been advances in activity recognition, for example, in computer vision that could overcome some of the limitations? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I'm not sure, I can't speak for Carol, but I guess both of those contexts, I, I think I'm more imagining this scenario. So it's an online uh, virtual environment, but there's definitely a lot of interesting work. I think Sydney DeMello and maybe Nick has been involved with it as well. Uh, of classroom research um, and collaboration. So I'll pause for a second. And if Nick wanted to speak about that work or. Yeah, well, for, yeah. So this human autonomy systems, uh, really interesting. And for me, I'm a one trick pony coming from like a dynamical systems perspective and the work that we did of measuring these multi-channel multimodal behaviors um yeah it's just having having a uh having a, a like an ai that is able to team to guide um team performance in a more effective direction and i, I think of this in terms of like travis wilshire's work and he has this this he has this like example that he gives where this can happen where you have this synthetic agent um where to work there has to be some assurances right that the feedback that you're receiving from this, this agent is trustworthy. And, um, but the agent's monitoring the coordination that's going on, right? And it's, it's determining the appropriate thresholds for when to, to, to kind of interject, right? When you might have like a distracted teammate, for example, he uses that as an example, somebody's less engaged. 
Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like th something like that monitoring, like just levels and engagement through machine vision, you know, where people are looking, there's joint attention. These things are easier to kind of exploit, right? And if you have a system that in real time is tracking where there's instabilities in, in how the system's coordinated, meaning the teammates. I think it really, to me, that's the most exciting, is a really exciting direction, right? Of how to, um, mm -hmm. um, of how to interject at the right time with, within the right modality, but also to have a agent that is able to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of, the, of their intervention, right? And, and, and whether that intervention actually returned the state, the, the system to like a stable state to, to uh, where now people are engaged. Um, and, and, and that in a virtual environment, like in a Zoom-like kind of thing, seems really doable. Now in a, in a classroom uh, environment, which is much more noisy and complex, uh, not so much. And you know, the, challenge, the challenge is to scale it um, yeah, to that environment. So I uh, I really love the points that Nick brought up of um, uh, detecting what the kind of current state is and measuring what state learners are um, returning to. Nick kind of particularly pointed out engagement as being a state. Um, I think, though, in, in these conversations, one thing I want to add is that um, uh, from a kind of equity and justice perspective, uh, I think it's important to pay attention to how we're defining those states um, in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, reinforce a, a particular norm of what it means to be engaged. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, engaged or what it means to be collaborative or, or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that kind of part of these AI systems that perhaps might, you know, uh, AI teammates, part of it can be um, expanding our definition definitions of what it means for learners to be engaged and being mm. able to be reflexive and responsive to a variety of definitions and not just um, uh, not just certain definitions that mm -hmm. replicate, for example, Western um, and white perspectives of what it might mean for a learner to be to be engaged. Because like I said, that can certainly vary um, for student to student, culture to culture, classroom context. Um, there are so many different things that can affect why uh, uh, that can affect what engagement actually means for for a learner. Yeah, Angela, I think you're you're touching on something that's really fascinating. So, I've been toying with this idea, and I've come up with a like I've done a few talks around the idea of elusive inclusivity. So we're all talking about yeah. inclusivity and equity, but like, what does that what does that mean? If you had to like mo actually model it and critically, like I I have been doing a lot of work around inclusivity and sort of differences between males and females and differences between uh, minorities and majority students as they collaborate um, along their discourse. Um, and it, it keeps coming up in my brain is like, what is what feels inclusive to one person might not feel inclusive to another. Um, and I think mm -hmm. with the next stage of our research, at least it's going to, I mean, it's already posing a lot of thought problems uh, for me about how do you provide feedback under that umbrella, right? So how do you actually <laughs> decide, you know, this is going to make so-and-so feel better or worse, or when that is such a subjective sort of um, construct? Yeah, well, I, totally. I think it's even, what I was going to say, it's even more challenging when you think about Angela's point with regards to uh, broadening the definition, make, making sure you're capturing uh, a a large enough distinction for something like engagement. And when you talk about feedback, it gets even more complicated because mm -hmm. I wanted to bring in, you know, what's the training data? You know, you because that we know has been a consistent problem with so much of this AI implementation. When we're talking about uh, diversity and inclusion, and we're talking about these different kinds of contexts context in which this is happening, that uh, presents a very, challenging uh, problem when it comes to how are you collecting, where are you collecting the data uh, in order to train whatever is the AI that you're hoping to develop in these in these various educational settings. And I'm curious, is that, are they talking about the training data in any of the realms in which you all are operating uh, that's going to be developing the algorithms that supposedly are going to do these wonderful things? I can kind 
of add on and uh, <laughs> respond a little bit. Um, so, so I. Uh, uh, and Nia kind of posed this question of um, uh, elusive inclusivity and like, uh, what does that even mean to be inclusive considering that definition is going to vary for literally everyone of how, how it, they feel inclusive. Um, uh, and kind of one way I've been thinking about this in my own work at AI systems is what are the ways that we're allowing learners um, to have agency in the system and respond um, and respond and change the system themselves. So one thing that you know you could think of, for example, is um, perhaps there are ways for the learner to be able to. Um, uh, plug into whatever the underlying algorithm or model is and say like, oh, actually, you detected this thing wrong for me, or oh, actually, I'm not, at, I, I am engaged when you said I wasn't, or like, here's a bit of a definition of what it means for me to be engaged. And so this kind of um, I, I, human in the loop can be one way of gathering more of that training data um, where the learners are kind of uh, live in live time making edits to the underlying model. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to keep the human in the loop. And also, I mean, Steve, to your point, yes, we know that, I think everybody knows that we're going to have a lot of biases in data and that that, that problem, that issue is not absolutely and no one's going to sit here and scream that that's completely solved i mean there there have been some advances of where we can detect it once to detect different biases of um once they're starting to occur within the real time uh, i was uh have been speaking some working a little bit with uh, gloria washington everett howard who's been detecting microaggressions and little little rude demeaning comments um, it can be very biased and finding ways to detect those and it, and it offers a chance to intervene but I mean when you want to talk about language models and, and going in the direction there of the corpora our society has these biases so of course it, it's going to be there it, it's going to even be in the language models it's mm -hmm. it's at this point I view it as um, a huge uh, a huge challenge that we do have to conquer one kind of, I don't know, kind of interesting idea I was thinking about yesterday on this topic that is afforded for uh, learning and even an assessment for collaborative problem solving. And I'm kind of leaning more on the collaborative problem solving right now than, than collaborative learning, but well, it could be used for both. But the ability to be anonymous um, while solving a task or to pick an agent to represent yourself to hopefully reduce some of these just immediate biases that people would have and also it could this is not from ETS this is just me talking right now because I'm kind of scared to tip it the idea of of standardizing across because I, I know we don't want to try to say every culture must conform to what we think is appropriate collaborative problem solving but if you have one person who's you know they're, they're not talking they're not sharing information because maybe in, the, in that society uh, and, and putting some of your your research in and yours, Angels. I mean, it, the female wasn't supposed to speak as much. It might be gender differences or whatever to to fit with the social norms of the day. But if there were anonymity and it was kind of a standardized protocol of this is good collaborative problem solving, you need to share information, especially if you have interdisciplinary uh, expertise going on or uh, jigsaw type tasks in a learning environment. What if it was kind of standardized and you just kind of drop in like, oh, you're not talking. You might want to talk. This is just kind of a, a wild idea of my own. I think that's interesting. I mean, I think we actually have planned uh, some studies that include modality um, and anonymity aspects to them um, because there is actually some literature that suggests even with remote in online environments, even with the removal of uh, that it, their cues are there. So oh. if you were represent, Carol was represented by <clears throat> some uh, neutral gendered avatar and with a neutrally gendered name um, uh, uh, and culturally new, neutral, neutral as well, I would pick up signals from your discourse alone that would make me either consciously or unconsciously react as if you are a female. 
What if it was transformed though, to make it more, to, to try to hide those? I don't know. I'm, just kind of, I'm, I'm thinking way out of the box on the no, equality standpoint. I think it's interesting. Trying to standardize. Okay, so bring, bring um, it back now. I'm out. In the oh box. yeah, I'm gonna bring it back. I'm gonna bring it back. So <laughs> I think we we've talked about some interesting things that I think in the context of AI to facilitate a learning environment to sort of attempt to pay attention to these um, different types of cues. Oh, I don't know. My baby is screaming in the back. Um, but <laughs> but um, what I think I'd like to shift a little bit to is, is sort of capturing some critical processes using AI that excites you or that you've done recently, um, particularly around cognition, um, around emotions, around social processes, um, for AI that's temporally sensitive and able to sort of gain a context of the interaction. Um, what what has been done recently that excites you guys around sort of the modeling side of the use of AI with collaboration? Okay, I'll jump in I again. Can, no oh. one else? <laughs> or, Nick, were you about to talk? Because I'd love to hear uh, about this. No, this. just that. Well, sure. I was just going to throw a, a couple of things out that are, that are interesting to me in terms of like adaptive feedback. Um, uh, so like a lot of the work that I've been doing is with cognitive feedback, right? And these real simple measures of like, you know, verbosity of like speaking time and, and giving measures of visual attention. Um, but one thing that I've been working on lately is language markers of, of engagement and common ground and how to capture that in real time. And then to uh, find instances where people are maybe converging, they're perseverating on a particular topic for too long and, and trying to identify whether, you know, that's leading them astray, right? They're not engaging in creative, flexible problem solving. And if you can intervene at that time, at that moment when you can pick it up through language, because a lot of the measures have been, or at least from my limited experience here, is, is through, you know, more kind of these like uh, more behavioral measures of where people are looking or even kind of uh, are moving or how they're moving on, on a screen, you know, manipulating a device. Um, but to take advantage of these big, you know, high-dimensional semantic models um, that, and, and the advances that are going on there, uh, GBT3 and all of this, um, to, to find interventions that are around, yeah, the, the, um, the convergence and divergence of how people are settling on particular topics in a semantic space. It's really interesting. And then and then um, stuff that it, like biofeedback and effective feedback are two interesting areas as well um, that I like to I like to like know more about personally. Uh, but effective feedback in particular of just um, of, of creating greater emotional awareness for teams that are remote, right? So people that are don't have the nonverbal cues that normally or would would be useful for signaling effective feedback. Um, how can a virtual agent step in to kind of help like um, um, alleviate tension or stress or anxiety or whatever that might be accumulating that might not be as really obvious given like in a remote mm -hmm. learning environment. Anyway, so those are just a couple things just to throw it out. Yeah, I really like the idea of, of the the um, convergence and that divergence in terms of common ground or or just the discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if any of that in any of that because there's all this work. I guess coming out of the uh, Steve area, the team team science more area it, in phases of collaboration. Mm, phases. Um, uh, have you found any evidence of that? Or uh, yeah, so that's exactly where we're we're trying to go with it, right? Or look at um, how people shift these different kind of attractor spaces, right? So you can imagine uh, as people converge on a particular topic, they settle into an attractor. And it depends on like how long are they in the attractor before they shift to a new topic. These types of timing components are are super critical. And yeah, try to pick up on exactly that dynamic and yeah. that change. Um, right, right. So it, it, the the terms you're using to describe these is, is is fascinating. And you know, <laughs> as we were talking about University of Pittsburgh and LRDC earlier, I'm remembering the work that was done in the Pitt CMU collaborations. Uh, when they were looking at student learning and problem solving, 
And first there was like a the dual space model of problem solving where they're talking about there's the hypothesis generation and then there's the mm -hmm. hypothesis testing space. And then those evolved over the years where they talked about the, the, the different kinds of phases. But this is a hard problem. You, you know, you talked about attractors and things like mm -hmm. that. It's the old school. We talked about convergence. We talked about divergence. We talked about fixation. And these are challenging things for humans to deal with. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to collaborative problem solving when and in different realms, you know, I'm studying in scientific teams now. Uh, they they need to work through these things mm -hmm. themselves. They need to explore the problem space. You know, they need to figure out, they need to, to understand it. And in our macrocognition and teams model, we talk about that in the first couple of phases where it's you're trying to explore, you're trying to define the problem space before you even get into starting to think about what are the potential hypotheses, what are the potential solutions. And the, my main point is that's incredibly difficult for humans to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to hope that an AI has the, the, the capability to reflect on what is the possibilities of a problem space that they've sufficiently explored is very challenging. So getting back to some of your all's points though about engagement or a, about anything like that, maybe it can detect the subtle cues that says, okay, you know, we, we people may lean back when they're done talking about topic X. Right. And that may be detectable in such a way that the AI can say, okay, you know, should we talk about this more? Or maybe we should think about another possible mm -hmm. element of the problem. That's really, really fascinating um, <clears throat> to go. Cause I know we're actually, I have a student, Steve, that's <laughs> using some of your work to uh, combine it with dynamical systems modeling um, a, a dynamical systems approach to modeling cohesion in teams, um, mm -hmm. looking exactly at different phases and transitions within a team and trying to understand, I think what you were getting at, it's an open question of where is that break point? Um, when is something sufficient and they move on to the next phase? And the fact that they aren't linear uh, in, the, in the natural sense that we think about. Okay, yeah, right, right now. <laughs> The first thing I was taught by the dynamical systems thinkers were it's not stages, Steve, it's phases. You know, I had to move <laughs> from that very incremental to recognize that it's a, it's a soft transition where I, mm -hmm. I was very much in this discrete, it's, this happens and then this happens as opposed to no, it's a, it is this transition where some new things are happening while the old things are still happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that may mm -hmm. be detectable uh, if you have the right level of abstraction to look for semantic markers of some kind of transition going on, you know, and Travis has been doing some of that uh, in his work. And, it, you know, he, he did, he was able to detect these, uh, these kinds of phase transitions in more simple collaborative problem solving environments. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it is going to be feasible, uh, but again, it, it's going to get down to what's the right level of abstraction for the kinds of things we're discussing that's going to be transportable across so many different contexts. Mm -hmm. right. And that's, that's a very difficult problem. Well, maybe it's that, so in, <clears throat> at least in some of my work on emergent roles that individuals occupy in teams, I found that um, certain categories of roles seem to be generalizable to certain settings. Uh, so by that, I mean, um, you know, uh, there's all sorts of varying numbers of teammates in collaboration. You can have large teams, small teams, you can have, uh, teams that are primarily like university, uh, students collaborating to solve some, you know, problem for their class versus you have expert engineers that come together. Um, what is that? Open IDEO is a platform where they actually have like real, engineers that try and solve socially relevant questions uh, with high stakes, they actually get funded and so forth. Anyway, so the dynamics of teams can look very different and operate at different time scales. What I have found is, at least in my research, that there does seem to be some generalizability in the context of, you know, small university students, small teams that are based at a big, based on university students collaborating or problem solving about some topic that and then there are other roles that sort of come out in more distributed open environments like massive open online courses or um, those uh, crowd-based design engineer teams. Um, so maybe it's understanding the boundaries to which it is generalizable 
um, and just operating within those. And I, well, I think what's important about your work is that it's, it's taking this more grounded approach, looking right at the linguistic markers of what is determining the social roles as opposed to the org science work that was looking at social roles using surveys, for example. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, know, we know from the org science literature about the existence of social roles versus task roles, um, but your work is, is more relevant in the sense that it, it's not beholden to those survey instruments. You're able to identify it just through the communications. So that, that affords, I think, a, the interesting generalizability and what I'm curious, though, is while I can kind of, I, you know, I can get it when it's undergraduate moving to a professional setting, given that we're at a conference on education, do you think it can move backwards into uh, high school, junior high kinds of groups, given that you're relying right. on language so much? I mean, has anyone tried to look at those kind of social roles in younger groups? Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sure people have. Um, we. I don't think probably there's been a lot um, with the younger populations in that particular area, uh, but I'm definitely personally interested in our lab to explore that both in high school students, but also middle um, middle school students. I think um, I think I just don't have those particular collaborations uh, underway to have access to that uh, type of data. That's really my only uh, limit right now. Um, but I I don't know the degree to which. I think the dynamics could look different. Um, like I said, I think understanding and exploring the degree to which something generalizes uh, and understanding the boundaries to operate in um, are kind of key for, for us. So I wanna take a quick pause and just remind uh, or let our audience know that um, I feel like there's some comments that are coming through on, sl uh, on Slack, uh, on Zoom, but I think on the WOVA app, if you have any questions for our panelists that you'd like to ask, feel free. I'm, I'm trying to monitor that. Feel free to put them there. Um, we'll continue diving deeply into <laughs> wherever our brains seem to take us in this moment. Um, but I uh, will keep an eye out for that. Uh, there was one question from Nadia in, in Zoom, and she says, maybe this is sort of something the panelists could, because it asks for references. She said, hi, can you provide me please with some examples of available slash open collaborative learning platforms slash tools based on AI slash ML or references of papers on that. Um, so maybe that's some of these questions might um, be better answered after the fact. And so the WOVA app, um, you're able to respond to things and and throw in references after our discussion. Um, but I think it's a great question because I'm always looking for open collaborative platforms to explore uh, that are easily manipulatable. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to kind of get into the theoretical side a bit with this um, idea of the use of, of AI perhaps as teammates. Um, and particularly the question is what aspects and concepts should we consider in the design of AI teammates? in a collaborative environment, and what are the phenomena of interest that really matter for the develop, development of theoretical predictions? That's sort of a, a mouthful. So if we, let's forget about the, the obstacle as academics, I feel like I shouldn't have started out with that first question that was, you know, what's the most promising thing? Because as academics, we're always like hedging. We're like, but it could be. Um, so let's sort of think about if we could make an AI system uh, that could be used as a teammate, with a goal towards developing new theoretical predictions, what might be the, the characteristics or phenomena of interest that we might want to intentionally design uh, with it? So I, I can go ahead and start while you guys percolate on that for a second. Um, I like this question because I think one of the things that perhaps we haven't touched on very much in this conversation, but I think it's a has a lot of potential with AI. Um, again, uh, thinking about how can we use AI to improve existing theories of cognition and social processes, to update them, to gain additional evidence and support or rejection of you know, some of our seminal 
uh, theories um, to allow us to kind of really zero in and test things to see, is this still true? Does it, is it true in this context or, or is it only true in this other context? I guess refined theoretical, our theoretical understanding of cognition and uh, social processes in teams. Um, and I, I would like to throw out, I guess, one uh, uh, more intentional um, phenomena of interest would be in the context of uh, inclusivity and equity. Um, so I guess this goes back to what Angela was talking about before. How might we design this is not a question for you, but like I would design an AI system with an eye towards something that would allow us to better understand um, uh, felt experiences of inclusivity in teams. Um, and I don't know more, I'll just pause there because I can just go on. <laughs> yeah, I think to me, a lot of this comes back to the definitions of, of collaboration also before I get to like, you know, sure. my, my head up in the clouds, um, because there are so many different definitions that are out there. And a, a primary one that I've been operating off of is uh, largely developed by uh, Jessica Andrews Todd, who I've been an SF thing together to, to measure the collaborative problem solving. And it's funny because it's, it's jumping right off the research that others have mentioned right here. Like Steve, I mean, uh, we're, we're going right in with the exploring and understanding is a main feature. And Nick brings up the common ground and the Clark, the Clark type research. Okay, we absolutely need those communication forums as well um, because we are looking at the social and the cognitive dimensions. So we have to kind of know what are we aiming for and the definition of what would be good collaborative problem solving is something that I think is currently kind of hindering some of the progression of this research because we're always, I feel like, trying to align various definitions um, across different people's research. So say, say we'd all like agree, yeah, okay, well, we, we all know we want, well, I think everybody agrees. We all know we want the social, we all know we want the cognitive, um, at, least, at least with those aspects. And so thinking about how the, the AI can intervene, if I think about uh, modeling the human behavior and uh, per, personally, I, I do a lot more with, clustering algorithms based off of theoretically grounded features to identify different types of collaborative problem solvers. But the, the lingering question is always there, which, which other people have, have um, alluded to, which is, well, over time and in different teams, how would the person then act, right? And, and compared to the various roles, the roles in the different contexts, et cetera. Um, so with that, I mean, the coolest thing that AI as a teammate could do if it was extremely good NLP, which is also uh, a hindrance. I know that, that Sydney Crow and, and Nick and you guys have, have made a lot of advances in the, in the NLP, but to get it just like the, the you know, perfect accuracy where we could detect these different skills and have the teammate be able to respond in ways to kind of test how much um, the human knows as far as, or has done as far as exploring and understanding, are they going to share information? What if they're dealing with someone who won't share any information back? What if they're dealing with someone who is, I don't know, I found profiles of super social people who don't actually have the cognitive processes going on or some that do and then none of the social, how would you interact in those various environments? Um, what if you had an agent that was perfectly aligned to try to set up common ground as we know is with humans is bleeding often with what is it 50% of the time we're not even really talking about the same thing um, and so uh, there's so many different experiments we could do if we could really truly model that human behavior and and test a lot of the theories on communication mm -hmm. on problem solving them it's in and of itself as a construct and a and a definitions of this as a construct. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And as far as the inclusivity goes, there could also be um, 
the goal is just to reduce the bias as much as possible, more than a human is going to do. And, and once again, that's going to come with the issue of the language models from the corpora are going to be biased as well. But we could at least attempt to filter through for quite a bit of that and give that opportunity to reduce that. But I don't think the solution is to do something more like what was done with MPSA 2015, which, which was very, um, very interesting and very admirable uh, take, but it was more multiple choice type answers from an AI agent. But rally, really, we need the, the AI agent as a teammate who could change roles up. That's really interesting, Carol. I think tackling on to the idea of common ground, I wonder if we couldn't use uh, uh, to, um, a way to have an AI as a teammate and program it for some level of cohesion with the interactional partners and then see how varying that level of cohesion or common ground, uh, how that helps or hinders the interaction. Oh, yeah, and then the affective processes yeah. of who gets frustrated and just kind of quits. Okay, go on. Sorry, go on. Well, I was going to say before that, getting back to um, what you were saying about how do you define collaboration, um, I was thinking through the different ways that AI can participate. Uh, so mm. we think about it, we're, we're looking at it from at least three different forms of participation. Uh, first and foremost, think of AI as a centaur, where it's, it's about the dyadic relationship where the artificial intelligence is one with a human member of the team to make us stronger, faster, smarter. So it's not an AI that's with the team, it's the AI with a member of the team. So as a simple example, you know, Google Scholar is my go-to AI if I can't remember something. Imagine I have that AI on my shoulder that's always with me that can help me access information. And that's been an attempt with decision support systems that they've been introducing automation and AI into them for the past decade or so. They're trying to help an operator, a human operator, for example, in the military, have instantaneous access by having it being pushed to them at the appropriate time. So that's a centaur-like concept. And we're seeing that in Go uh, in chess mm -hmm. now, where they're doing just that, where it's no longer a human playing an AI, it's a dyad human AI playing another dyad human AI. So that's the simplest way to think about a centaur. That's first step. The other is as the monitor or coach, where it's not really part of the team, it's just overseeing. And a lot of the examples mm -hmm. you all have provided about intervention or feedback is kind of along those lines. And then I think the more difficult is the AI as a teammate. So mm -hmm. my colleagues have written about that before. They use the term from tool to teammate, where the AI is now mm -hmm. specifically participating as a member of the team. And when it gets to that level, it's even more important to pay attention to these kinds of things Carol's bringing up with regard to the social components. Mm -hmm. Because we know that AI can do the task stuff really well. What we're talking about is the social aspects of the interaction. That's where all the things that you all are mentioning about inclusivity, about engagement, all of those are orthogonal to the task elements. That's the hard part. That's the human part. That's mm -hmm. the social cognitive components of the interaction. That's the emotion. That's the cohesion. Those are the things that matter over and above just understanding the task, understanding the semantics well. It's understanding the group dynamics. Mm -hmm. and, what's, and just another point is that you know, you can train one of these systems by interacting with people, different types of people. And, you know, the, the algorithms that you might use, like a deep neural sort of network uh, to learn. But the behavior of these, you know, of what it's learning, it's fairly opaque. So it might behave actually very bizarrely uh, in certain situations that just make it hard to accept it as a, as a, as a teammate, as a partner. And, and then there's like, what other capabilities should it have, you know, to make it acceptable that, emulate the errors we make right in interaction mm -hmm. that sometimes we're egotistical mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. uh we have limited memory we don't predict uh you know we don't have a complete shared mental model and we make wrong assumptions and but those kind of kinds of things are kind of expected and um and and and, and humanize you know the, the, that yeah. relationship make it make it familiar and a machine mm -hmm. that's too good um that doesn't have those errors will just have this kind of uncanny valley sort of 
um, feel to it, I imagine. Yeah, and the errors is a good example because we can introduce psychological safety, we can introduce yeah. constructive conflict, we can introduce a lot of the concepts that come out of just the team learning and the team literature in general uh, with that one point about how do they deal with errors? Well, yeah. teams and people deal with errors in many different ways and we know it can be beneficial, but we, can know, we know it can be deeply problematic if they're not dealing with it in a healthful way. But, and, but at the end of the day, you know, it's the assumption should be that autonomous systems, they don't judge, right? They, they don't judge you. So that, that, that what you just said, psychological safety actually is pretty important is that these human autonomy teams, they allow maybe for people to be more comfortable in reporting information that they wouldn't normally because of embarrassment or, you know, of, mm. of, of making mistakes oh. themselves. Um, which can, I think can you elaborate? I don't, I'm oh. having difficulty imagining what you're describing. Oh, just that since the system doesn't judge you, right, as a, as a teammate, as a partner. So it, there's, you're talking there's, about just a dyad, not, I'm not talking a about just, team. I'm talking about like a dyad, yeah, okay, dyad, we can use that as an example, right, that you can give it information um, that uh, you would normally, you know, want to just, you wouldn't want to disclose, right, because it's embarrassing for whatever reason. Or just if you're trying to collaborate, you know, trying to problem solve and you're you're making guesses and you're brainstorming and you're kind of talking out loud and all this, it's something that's hard to do with a partner that, again, that you fear is going to judge you, where there's where the psychological safety might be compromised, right? That, that. But with a with a with an autonomous agent, um, there's more freedom to to make errors, I suppose, or um, uh, to deviate from the normal etiquette of, of interaction, right? Of politeness norms or things along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be more freeing and more opening and more, it'll allow more creative ideas to be generated. Because um, you don't have to like save face or... Save face, um, yes, yeah. 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 And I, it I, also I, might help a lot with exploring and understanding problem spaces because as of uh, most... Pretty much all the data I've seen right now, it's it, I'm looking at HCI exploration and understanding, not what I think that people what, what Steve was alluding to earlier, a uh, real ex exploration and understanding of a problem space, because that's where you make the errors. That's where you have the space to to do the things that you might fear others would perceive as naive or stupid or whatever. Um, and what I'm seeing in a lot of the data, it's just it almost looks like an HCI problem. Like, let me make sure the interface works. These I'm being monitored, other people are around. It's just like a bunch of junk in a log data what, rather than having the chance to really explore and understand the problem um, that lays ahead if you weren't having had that ability to save face like you're talking about, Nick. Exactly, yeah. I think that uh, this kind of AI teammate space can also be used as um, uh, almost a, a practice space for learners to um, try out the ways that they might collaborate with others, try out the ways that they might exhibit their own agency. Um, so like one thing that I'm thinking a lot of in my own work or what um, uh, how can um, how can we enable um, learn? How can we support learners in um, technology kind of technology based activism? Um, and one thing that we're kind of thinking about and finding in that space is that um, learners need these specific practice spaces in order to be able to practice these activism kind of mm. um, uh, kind of skills. And it maybe doesn't even need to like just stop at activism based skills, right? Like for that's one space, but um, you can even foresee, you know, practicing public speaking skills, pack, uh, practicing other communication skills. So I think that having an AI teammate can be used as a space for learners to build confidence um, uh, where they won't be um, judged as Nick was as Nick was saying, or where they don't feel the need to save face as, as Carol was saying. Yeah, I, I really like that. It, um, the Institute for Creative Technologies was working on uh, using AI for like things like culture training uh, mm -hmm. to for a deployed military when they're going overseas. Like, you know, you're going to be in a new culture. You don't understand it. Let's help you try to understand how to interact with the people in these in these 
uh, population. So in this case, what you're describing, you know, Angela is really intriguing because I think AI is sufficiently sophisticated enough where you can practice these, these kinds of co collaboration competencies like assertive communication uh, or question answering or question asking. Mm -hmm. And it, in, in, in real time, an AI could diagnose the sentiment, could diagnose the assertiveness and say, well, that was okay, but you weren't, you know, you weren't assertive enough. Maybe try it again. And when it mm -hmm. comes to things like question asking, depending upon the context of the question, uh, I think AI could probably, um, given what I've seen with some of the latest chat uh, GPT kind of stuff, could probably say whether or not that was a clear enough question, because mm -hmm. we know in these collaborative learning environments that it's the questions you ask each other that are going to drive the kinds of interdisciplinary learning that uh, we talked about earlier is really necessary. So if you're not asking the right questions in the first place, you're not going to get the information you need. So using what you're saying, Angela, as a way to, to, to train them, to practice the behaviors would be something more immediately implementable than I think anything we've been talking about so far. Hmm. That's wonderful. I'm glad that this stimulated some good conversation. Um, we actually have only a few minutes left, but uh, we do have one question um, from an audience member. And I think it's actually a really nice uh, question to end on if you guys um, want to each of the panel, as she says, for each of the panelists, what are your top variables slash constructs that you think AI should focus on in moderating, on moderating in the context of collaboration? I think you should be able to see it as well. It's, it's on the Q&A part of the, the Zoom button at the bottom. I don't know if you have that. <clears throat> you want me to repeat it if you can't see it? Well, while they're looking for it, I, um, when it comes to moderating, which again is what I we're calling like the coach approach for AI, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'd say that understanding conflict and the different kinds of conflict, whether it's constructive conflict that is intellectual conflict, task-based conflict versus interpersonal mm -hmm. kinds of conflict, I think that that's going to be a really crucial and a very difficult thing for AI uh, to understand. And then when it comes to AI and what should be um, and what is the very difficult challenge for AI is going to be theory of mind. It's going to be mm -hmm. the capability to understand what is going on in the mind of another with whom they are interacting. So the ability of AI to make mental state attributions in the, in the absence of overt communication is the really tricky part of collaboration. I completely agree. Does anybody have anything they would want to add to that question? I'm going to just, change, just add jump on. on and just say that I agree completely. And I think that predicting, <laughs> predicting the intent, like anticipating the needs, uh, even mm -hmm. the actions of another for like rapport building, I think that's a huge challenge, but a really interesting one. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, adding, adding on to that a little bit, um, I think that also um, considering the ways that learners might have agency in the space and being able to support their agency, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that uh, often in these kind of uh, educational spaces, what we really want to do is we really want to support learners in being able to go out in the world and uh, achieve their goals, learn things on their own, uh, you know, in, in other words, have have agency um, in their own way and I think that if if there is a way for AI to be able to kind of understand that um, then we can support building those those learners agency a lot better that's awesome I'll throw on a quick last minute comment because I agree with everyone great thoughts and also back to Steve's point of the conflict I'd love to see more with negotiation on kind of a simplified issue because see very little of it in the data and that negotiation and assertiveness I think are things that might might be able to see more immediate results if people had more training for um, especially things like uh, wage gaps uh, in the U.S. That if people had the opportunity to practice those skills. Wonderful. I, I, I'm really glad. Thank you 
to our audience members and thank you to our panelists for this lively discussion. I'm so glad I got to see you all at least virtually. Um, and we look forward to hearing and reading all of your future papers that are coming out. And I'm sure you took time away from to come do this.